big question, I guess, um, I would say the last six years I've been in Korea teaching ESL. Um, although I like to think of it not so much as just English as a second language, it's kind of like you were saying before you, you started recording with the project based learning. Um, a lot of critical analysis that the kids hear in their everyday public schools, I don't think necessarily get as much of. Um, but I shouldn't paint too broad of a stroke because I haven't done any public education here in Korea. All right. Um, but yeah, this is this is a continuation of what I was doing in the States. Um, I was a coach and a teacher. I got my English licensure in Massachusetts, but um, a lot of places I was looking for were looking for dual license, like English and history. Really? Um, so I'm not sure. Maybe you can imagine after going through that, the ringer of getting your English license and kind of being like, yes, I can get some <laughs> job. And then everyone <laughs> saying like, okay, we'll just try a little harder. Oh. <laughs> That led me to um, looking online, you know, there were a lot of like advertisement type positions and this was a kind of advertisement and I thought, you know what I mean, I'm still young, why not try it out and um, give you free housing and all that stuff. Um, so I, I came here, but really tried to make my way away from being too sponsored so that I could have a little bit of leeway in the classroom. I don't know if you're familiar with a lot of the Hagwon systems around here, but they kind of give you a curriculum and um, expect you to, you don't have to teach to the curriculum exactly, but they expect you to follow that kind of cookie cutter mm -hmm. uh, format. And so, you know, and you are familiar more than likely, you know, the phrase teaching for the test, you know, so that everybody looks good on paper, uh, both the, the students and the teachers. And, you know, that reflects on how well the school does. And I think it even impacts how much money they get from the federal government, but I may be speaking out of turn. Is that kind of what you're seeing there as well? Um, I wouldn't say that in, in my experience, um, it does happen you do see a lot of academies kind of their businesses. So they're just matriculating students, whether or not they hit specific standards. Standards aren't exactly a hard um, cutoff line. They're more of like an amorphous uh, funnel to keep them moving through their business. And I mean, public education functions that way. Some of the time, I, I was I don't know if you've read Freakonomics, but there is a an interesting um, an interesting chapter about how I can't remember the the city that it happened in, but during two thousand and two, they were trying to get test scores up, and they did some research into how many of the teachers were cheating the system just to get like funding for their their school systems and so it's not just a private academy problem but yeah it does it, it crops up and i feel like it kind of pulls away from the learning process mm -hmm. and it's kind of a, a shame so we here as adults and it's not just the two of us it's actually a lot of people um, across the globe, uh, even. So uh, as you connect more and, you know, the international school systems, those who really are empowered uh, to make change, hopefully we will. It's so it's not just about, uh, you know, teaching for the content or teaching for the test or teaching to make sure that our schools stay open, but uh, really in empowering policy, policymakers, um, school administrators, than teachers in order to change the structure, you know, let's get back to learning, whatever that looks like. So I wanna get into the things that you wanted to talk about and that was TTRPG. Before we get into the, the conversation, however, 
can can you define what your idea of and what TTRPG is? Because I'm I'm throwing out this acronym, but I know our listeners and our those watching the con the video content here would be really interested to know um, what in the world <laughs> what's TTRPG. Sure. Um, TTRPG stands for tabletop role playing game. So if maybe the listeners are more familiar with RPGs, role playing games, where the character is um, being embodied by the player and you make action within a setting or a world that affects that world and, and the social interactions that the character takes. But the tabletop part of it is that um, the games are done generally through word of mouth or through writing systems. Um, I've seen some interesting stuff with um, illustrative, you know, using illustration and um, a lot of these have you know graphical content to it too nowadays you can have like the tabletop experience on the computer which kind of for me is bending the rules a little bit but it still gets the same point across i think ultimately a ttrpg is um narrating your experience your character's experience within a setting a world setting and what makes that that gameplay from your perspective kind of exciting and enthralling because the numbers are up you know this was a big thing uh you know it started i think with gary gygax and D, D back in the 70s and it kind of took a hit in the 80s because of of negative publicity by churches and whatever but there's a resurgence um and there's some actually now on you know, YouTube and, and other uh, video platforms, there's, you know, live streams of people playing tabletop role playing games, you know, um, and, I've, and for the life of me, I'm going to put it in the uh, in the comments here on YouTube, but I forget who they are, but there's there's names out there and, and wow, could you even imagine watching somebody else play a tabletop role-playing game and it being you know enthralling audiences that's so interesting you said that because i, I my experience with tabletop role-playing games i used to role play when i was a kid through mm -hmm. um writing um but the first time that i got into it was pathfinder which is kind of like the second most popular behind D, &D mm -hmm. um rpg out there i, I shouldn't say that so generally, though, there, I'm sure there's going to be a, a bunch of people that are, uh, no, that's not the case. But, um, and then this, like you're talking about this resurgence with um, Critical Role or Dimension. There you go. One, critical Role right? is what I was thinking of. And I actually watched a couple of their their videos. I shouldn't, I mean, I don't know if you, you do any sponsorship or anything through the podcast, but like, uh, yeah, I just have to say that I, I've watched every season and I'm kind of like <laughs> on edge waiting for the next episode to come out. Um, but it's it's so interesting to watch them because they kind of got like um, a whole setup. They have everything. They have like lighting and they have a studio for it. And so it's really taken a new leap in a very specific direction towards almost like TV broadcasting. Yeah, I mean, it could very much be equated to to broadcasting, but it's only a game. I mean, who would have thought we're watching, we're literally watching people play a role-playing game? Well, okay, not even that, but like, have you ever heard of Games Done Quick? No, I haven't. Okay, it's a, they do, um, they do cancer drives for, um, these, they, these people play games on speed running, they speed run games. Okay. And they do cancer drives and these cancer drives get like hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars donated to them because these people are just watching people play games really fast. Uh -huh. And so I think that I don't wanna denigrate the past generation, but I think the past generation really missed out on um the importance of games the importance of play not 
that they haven't done it in education. You know, there's plenty of activities that include games, but I think the idea that, oh, you're going home and you're playing a game, you're not doing your homework, you're kind of wasting your time. I think we're missing out on something there. And it's a, it's a major social facet that kind of ties into education. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I and I, I want to add to that. I, I totally agree with you. And, and I think it's because it there's a difference between, you know, playing Monopoly or playing a traditional board game where there's a, you know, a narrow set of rules. There's a, a complete identified objective, whether it's, you know, be the last person standing or whatever. The role playing game experience is a complete 180 turn on that because the goal may well the goal is not necessarily to win but to survive you know you, you want to increase your standing in in the world you want to gain of course riches you know we call that gold or silver pieces or you know objects but it's really the 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 living experience and when you really you know, abstract that, you know, we, we, our real experiences may necessarily be boring, you know, if we're going to school for six hours a day, and we're hearing lecture after lecture and doing homework, and then uh, we, we want an outlet, we want to live, you know, we want to experience life. And I think that's that the first thing about the role playing game is, it gives people an opportunity to experience some type of life. And they get to have adventures and they get to um, experience new things, interact with different people and take chances where otherwise they wouldn't necessarily have in their, in their real world, in their own lives. And, you know, then transitioning that to education, um, they're actually thinking, they're actually pondering their situations. They're actually making moral or immoral decisions or, right or wrong decisions, those things that, you know, maybe schools aren't supposed to teach, maybe they are to teach, but at the very core of it, you know, as, as we move on, yeah, they're actually thinking, and we could, we could pull from that experience and bring it back to the classroom. So let me, I know you, you sent me a couple of questions that we wanted to identify, so I'm going to really touch on the first one. And, and you made a pun of it. So what is our TTRPG bring to the table? Pun. <laughs> um, so what does TTRPG That's bring to the table in terms of education? What does it really add to the educational experience? So this is something really interesting that I've been looking into in my own learning. So I've been studying Korean um, and I'm, I'm doing the research on this, this tabletop RPG connection to learning and it involves a lot of reading and I have to look through research. So uh, I looked through, I went back to the basics and how to memorize things, how to take in information and Bloom's taxonomy is at the basis of everything. A lot of the learning that I'm seeing is rote memorization. A lot of that base you know, bottom level blooms, repetition, memorization, information based stuff. Um, but TTRPGs, they kind of attack that creative aspect right at the onset. Mm-hmm. They go into ethical questions. You know, you might have a situation like you were saying, ethics, ethics are involved. You might have um, here's one really bad dude and he has a family. And here's your two fellow party goers. Uh, and, and they're also pretty, pretty bad people. They, they've stolen some things, you know, or, or maybe they've, they've, you know, gotten rid of some other bad guys. And so they, the people that play TTRPGs start to learn right from the onset that a lot of these ethics are kind of, um, it's, it's a hard lesson to learn that we, we have to learn in some of the higher level classes that I teach, but like relative morality. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And it's such a simple concept when you embody a character and you're put in, in between these two situations or these two people, these two characters. Um, but thinking about it hypothetically, just as a student sitting in your chair that you have no connection to it, um, it, it doesn't really give you that depth of understanding. So I think the narrative, being a character inside of a narrative, having to make decisions that not only affect you, but also kind of reflect you as a person, mm -hmm. um, encodes that that information into the student quicker directly and do you, do you think that's because of the the decisions they have to make or the experiences they have to experience while in the game is that somewhat i think so um i don't know if you've heard of this this book is a recent book thousand a thousand brain theory a thousand brain theory it recently came out i'm pretty sure that's the title but it talks a lot about um reference frames and how our, our neocortex basically encodes things into 3D models of, of a mapped reality. Okay. So things that you know or things that you learn are all encoded into kind of a physical 3D model. And so abstract things like, you know, ethical um, relativism are hard to you can't really embody them unless you actually get into a situation where you have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we can always come up with hypotheticals and tell that to the student, but I think it's better to just get them straight into it. You know what I mean? And the game experience gives that, provides right. that. Yeah. Right. Cool. Mm -hmm. What else, you know, if we look at TTRPGs outside of the moral or ethical considerations, where where would an RPG sit fit um, in, in? And it doesn't necessarily have to be the classroom, but essentially for the learning experience itself. Um, I think it's really varied depending on who's doing the the dungeon master we call, well, in this case we would call it a game master but you know if it's if the teacher or the facilitator or the game master is making these modules and they're only lasting for a class period or they're lasting for a you know three week session mm -hmm. um they can build into it like they would activities into their curriculum they can build into it specific things that they want to teach the students but it all has a personal connection so that the student can embody that lesson so maybe you're doing some basic arithmetic with uh, a shopkeep you have to buy some equipment or something like that um geography is huge social political you know warfare mm -hmm. goes on in these games so i think it's kind of endless in some sense. It's unlimited in some sense, but it, it really relies on the person who's facilitating or managing the game. Cool. I like that. So something else that you brought up was, and I'm just going to read this out so that I don't mess, miss it. So what are some other methods that involve role playing that allow for, and what is that? a more holistic approach to the classroom. And so one, what do you think of, well, what, what is your interpretation of the holistic approach to the classroom? Then how does that tie into uh, role-playing games, really? Um, holistic, in my opinion, involves the student themselves, the environment from which that student comes or the feelings that they bring to the classroom, the classroom environment, um, the teacher or the facilitator, and the environment that the teacher or facilitator comes from. But not only that, that's kind of like the two parties involved, but also the information that is trying to be transferred. Um, <clears throat> I think a lot of the times we get stuck in thinking you know, I'm an English teacher or uh, I'm a math teacher, and we forget that those those kind of go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. You know, 
it's not that these subjects are they're not silos you know, anymore yeah right, we, exactly. we can't treat them like silos yeah exactly um so in terms of that i think that the role-playing game gives kind of an artificial i guess i'm going to use like a buzzword meta <laughs> sense you can like kind of go into it and come out of it and have that connection between yourself and the character and transfer those skills um so the question being what other kinds of methods are there out there and you know teachers do this all the time with english um uh, or second language learners they do conversational rp mm -hmm. you know you be the interviewer i'll be the interviewee um, and that's fantastic. That's, that's one of the ways that my kids learn in the classroom. And I think it's super effective. Um, but it's kind of, like you said, it's a silo. It doesn't have any of that contextual nature around it. Why do you want this job? Why would you want this job? Why are we in this interview? Why are we even learning English or math or something like this? Um, and it gives the power to the student to say, okay, this is a, a world that my character is in, and I, I want to find out about the world as well, not only, you know. Yeah. Right, because uh, the character is going to live with other people. So they're not just this isolated person in this world, you know, you know it's not the Garden of Eden. There's not a bunch of trees and birds and animals. There's other people there, um, other people who may not like you or may like you, or may want to go on an adventure, or need to build a house, or, you know, have fallen from a tree and need to be healed, some things like that. So the very aspects of the things that we face in our lives, you know, can be put into situations in the game. And I think one, and like I said before, before we started talking, Project-based learning, you know, is one of those methodologies that wants to force in whatever way they, it can, um, the removal of silo, the siloed experience in the school system. So you're going to integrate the math with the science. You're going to integrate the math science with the technology. Um, you're going to put that into a history lesson, and you can. Um, and then from there, you're going to, you know, have students experience the literature or the writing component, thus English. And so there's as long as, and the problem that I'm hearing uh, is that teachers aren't trained to do that. They're not trained to work collaboratively, get a lot of that, uh, with other teachers in the school because they have to focus on delivering a specific set of content, again, here in the States, a specific set of content, uh, reach certain benchmarks, reach certain, um, you know, objectives, learning objectives. And, you know, sometimes just getting through the day, the week, the month, the year um, is the challenge. And, you know, so it, it really would require a brand new paradigm in thinking about you know how to approach teaching and then learning so i so so i like that not that pbl and role playing are synonymous but there's a whole lot of need to take away that that silo experience so that's really cool one of the other things uh, that i was thinking about however is going back to the earlier days and how it was uh, and this is the role playing game experience was kind of shunned for a while before its resurgence was there was a group of people and that kind of thought it was evil in nature and i'm not going to go into that in our conversation but this isn't just about the the classroom or the teacher the facilitator and the student experience um what about parents uh, where do you think parents fit into to this kind of thinking in terms of education? How do parents fit into this? That's a good question. Um, I know in the current market, I guess we can call it a market because it's kind of a business focused um, area here. Um, there are certain 
parents that want very specific things uh, to their students so that they can hit those benchmarks, like you said, so that they can get those high test scores and they can graduate into and be accepted into uh, extremely prestigious colleges. Mm -hmm. uh, even in Korea, it's prestigious high schools. They're really aiming for those high schools. Um, and yeah, I think TTRPGs, like you're saying, we're talking about integrating science and tech and that STEM field, which I think is like a real big seller with TOEIC scores and TOEFL scores, you know, the, the language proficiency tests. Um, and if I were to tell a, a parent, hey, we're going to play a board game today, and this is how they're going to learn English, they might say, okay, how about uh, they don't pay you anymore and they fire you. So I totally. Hopefully that's not an option. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think that the kind of big paradigm shift that you're talking about would necessarily happen slower. It would happen incrementally. I think doing these PBLs is already happening in the classroom. There's a big focus on that being the capstone and the students are kind of uh, funneled towards that. Mm -hmm. But there's still a lot of focus on like prepping yourself with that rote memorization, that rote learning. And I get that. Um, I think parents just like to see numbers. A lot of parents like to see numbers. They like to see evaluations of their students. Um, and I think they focus on yeah, the evaluation. So if this is not an evaluative tool for learning, a lot of them are just going to, their eyes are going to go glaze over and they're, you know, they're not going to pay for the service or they're not going to engage in that at a public school. I think that's really an important question, how to implement that. Agreed, yeah. agreed. And, and and as you were as you were talking, then I was thinking about we focus so much on the, the quantitative, you know, is is my daughter getting A's, B's, is she is she is she making those benchmarks? Does it look good on paper? And I always go back to that. And yet, you know, literacy, and I have some colleagues who are, who are literacy professionals i mean they're just that's they, that's their space and if you if you quantify those numbers the people that read more tend to know more they're they're able to understand their world they've got the words to talk about their world they can explain ideas proficiently uh, they can talk about new things with confidence and competence. And so there's a whole lot to be said about really exploring your ability to think through reading, literacy, problem solving, and not just through content. And I'm big on that. Um, you know, I, 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 like I said before, I'm a big PBL uh, advocate and I've kind of uh, started that with my daughter, it, maybe not so much to the capstone component where we're going to do something and that may come later. But right now my daughter is 11 and she'll be 12 in two months. And, you know, I want to have conversations with her. I want her to read. I want her to really let her mind learn. And it's not just about memorizing the content, doing a couple of math problems and getting the idea. Let's go back and talk about <laughs> why two plus two is four and what do we do with that information? And I, I tend to use that example and I've used it quite frequently, um, but there's more to two plus two equals four than people recognize because what does the two mean? What does the two mean? What does the four mean? How can I use that addition? And how am I really thinking about problem solving rather than just knowing if I think real hard two plus two is four that doesn't necessarily bring me to a the ability to problem solve and to think about the problem um, so I, I think there's a lot there and I think you have a lot to offer um, if we are able to consider you know education as a learning experience and then 
bring in those tools that allow that learning experience to happen. Uh, you've identified one more question and I do wanna to get to it. The question reads, how do these approaches satisfy academic, creative, and is that right? No, criteria, sorry. How do these approaches satisfy academic criteria and how they can be used as evaluation tools? And I think that's what's critical. And the word evaluation is so critical in academia. We want to be able to put some type of quantitative measure on what a student is able to do. What do you think? Because <laughs> I've got some thoughts on this, but what do you think? Yeah, I would love to hear. Um, I just had down this this new, I, I should say, product that I just bought. It's from a group called Game to Grow, and they work with um, kids on the autistic spe spectrum, the autism spectrum, and they're developing TTRPGs. They developed a, a they they took D and D and they kind of cored it down, and it's called um, uh, Critical Core. And so basically, they're using that, and it comes with a facilitator's guide where you can implement uh, these therapeutic settings. It's not a diagnosis tool, and it's not a treatment tool for um, kids on the spectrum, but it does include kind of like a. Uh, it, it includes techniques to help with the symptoms of autism. Um, but the interesting thing that I saw from them is that they include core objectives like you would get from the common core in the mm -hmm. States. Um, some of the papers that you sent to me uh, included modules that had the research done and written statements about how certain parts of the module complete the criteria of the common core um, with reading, like I was saying with geography. And um, I mean, that that's pretty much endless. If, you, right. if you're writing your own stuff. Um, so other, there, other in some way there has to be a match to standards. Right. Standards have to apply somewhere. Right, totally. And I think that there are a lot of people out there that are naysayers for, you know, core criteria, but I mean, how else are you going to evaluate? How else are you going to judge on a kind we of need, We need some set of tools. Exactly. Um, and then I think just on a micro level, you can, it, it's not only the game that you're using to evaluate, but you can take a step back after the game or, you, or before the game, you can give them many assignments, you know, write about this character or write about the feeling that your character had or, um, you know, come up with a, a, a list of, like these PBLs you're talking about, you could make mini lessons that yeah. attach to the game that inform what the world is like. Make your own menu for this restaurant or um, come up with a, a business plan for <laughs> your hack and slash dragon killing team or something like this. Um, research is huge. If you want them to start understanding medieval times, if you want to do like you sent me the, the module with the, the Greek mythology basis, doing your own research, getting on the computer and actually diving into that mythos because you're interested because your character is a, a demigod or like things like this interest me, but I also see them interesting students. Being able to play within that world is so much better than being disconnected and told, okay, you need to miss these criteria because your teacher and your parents said so. Agreed, agreed. And it's it's going to be a continual, I don't want to use challenge, but definitely something that we always need to go back to. And it's not going to work and I don't want to be a naysayer, it's not going to work in every situation, in every school, and in every place. And we do recognize that. But when you start looking at the, I, want to, I guess the research, really, where it is being applied to certain school situations for certain populations of students, or even in therapeutic senses. And, and I actually, and this, like I said, going back a year ago, when this was really something on the forefront of, of what I was thinking, uh, 
there there is a company out there who actually has developed a training module for therapists and counselors to use role playing in that type of space now i'm not sure the credentials there and i'm not in that space because i'm not a therapist or a counselor so and it has to be done in such a way that it doesn't incite in the person you know feelings of frustration or self-harm or uh, all any kind of negative you know self feedback that says you know i'm going down the wrong path uh, again as long as it's in the right place and the educator teacher facilitator has really mastered the role of being the game master because it's easy to screw that up because <laughs> uh, if you're not a good game master then you're not really going to facilitate the learning experience either you could be a good teacher and right. be fantastic as you know a, a facilitator of of knowledge and, and content and homework but then you can't just come in there and oh i i, I played a D, D game this weekend it sounds cool let's try to put it in no there's a whole lot of you know practice and you know you have to get authorization and you have to really know what you're doing in order to make that work it's not just a flippant thing it's like pbl you know why well, i, I I want to do PBL now, and a, you know, teachers. I want to do PBL because I see, you know, the end results are really cool. But if you don't really know how to facilitate a project-based learning experience, you know, through inquiry, and investigation, class, sometimes it's hard enough just to get kids to talk to each other, you know, outside of just you know gossip in the classroom, and actually engage in appropriate, you know, interchange of ideas in a timed you know a timed manner uh through an appropriate structure so there would be a lot and how so you said you were doing research so where are you in the research is it just starting or are you in the middle can you talk about that a little bit um i think it's pretty much right at the beginning i'm doing a lot of research into the different um research that has been done in terms of the likability of the tool, um, the effectiveness of the tool as kind of a, um, as a as recall, using it as a recall tool. Um, I think a, a little bit of my research showed that a lot of students said that it would be excellent stuff in like a complementary way, but it couldn't replace lecture-based learning. Hmm. Um, on the other end of it i'm looking at the systems themselves i've seen that the common core not common core i'm sorry critical core um system that i was talking about earlier wander home is a new one that i just saw a couple days ago and it's not even it's not combat based at all it's mm. it's a, a lot of like collaborative social learning how does your uh, interaction with this person affect your environment as a whole and you kind of have to navigate these little niche er niche areas and specific characters with their you know um, particular personalities um but i'm i'm basically there i'm looking at a lot of different systems and trying to determine is it better to use a pre-made system is it better like you said to incorporate um, a kind of like, what do you call that? Like Linux-based, some, something that you know teachers can pick up and they can do their own thing with it as long as they know the basis of it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very overwhelming to see how much information. They, I thought, I didn't even think that this would be a thing when I started <laughs> No, it's a it. thing out there, yeah. You know, it's crazy that it's a rabbit hole and just taking it day by day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and when I started looking at it a year ago and you know did the initial Google search and then it, it was rather surprising to, to see that. And it's not 
a new thing. You know, some of the research is a decade or more old because people have thought about this for some time. And I think especially since it, it's now, you know, its popularity has is renewed. And so it's now acceptable as one, a form of entertainment, two, as a form of gameplay. But looking at it from those two perspectives and then abstracting the educational components, people are asking the question, why not? Yeah. You know, they're, they're literally asking the question, why can't this be an effective tool? Because if you look at it from the personal experience as a player, or even the, the game master, dungeon master, but as the player, you know, and, and then just casually observe what, what a four hour game would look like, you know, just it, through critical role or whatever else. What are they doing? You know, they have to, in order to succeed in any campaign, um, whether you're you're a beginner, a newbie, or you know you're you reached the maximum level and you you want to become that demigod. You know, you want to reach, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, omnipotence or uh, omniscience, whatever it is. Uh, you are constantly having to engage in your world. You have to talk to people. You have to ask questions of the person you know, whose world that you're in, what does this look like? What is this person doing? Because you can't make any assumptions with the world. Because if you do, then you'll end up doing something silly or stupid and you might get injured, hurt, or you might cause your comrades, your, your, your campaign party buddies to get hurt, injured, or even die, you know, and that's not something that you want because there's a, there's, there's the, then there's the interpersonal communication, not amongst the characters, but amongst the players themselves. Oh, well, this player is always setting us up for failure. So we don't want to. So it actually does kind of feed back into uh, the real world in terms of your, your person and, and how you are, you know, how you are interacting with the other players. You know, are you nice? Are you, are, are you actually engaged in the game? you know, what, what type of person are you? It's going to show up in your gameplay. Uh, so there's a lot to learn. And so there's, there's definitely a good amount of experience here um, that, that can be had. And if we look at it appropriately as an educational tool, and there's a lot of stuff going on. So I, I, I encourage you to continue your, your research. And then there's the literature that you have to review. I know it's out there and I've only shared with you a small piece of it. There's a lot more out there, but then look at it from, you know, there, there are people who are teaching and playing Dungeons and Dragons on, I think, Udemy or uh, OutSchool. Um, uh, so I know they've got, and OutSchool is kind of this virtual classroom experience by uh, that really hit big because of COVID-19 uh, uh, in like 2021. 20, 20, so uh, parents were sending <laughs> their, their, their 10, 11, 12 year olds to go, go to out school and see what they could learn. So there's a lot of platforms out there that really exposes this situation, this gameplay situation. Uh, so you can play tabletop, even tabletop virtually, not through <laughs> you, you did, everybody has to have the same map <laughs> so everybody has to have the same map in front of them and it doesn't have to be a map on but you do know they've got like tools they've got like um you know character development tools so everybody could kind of see on the platform who's what character and um the other thing what oh yeah uh you know virtual dice roll uh, oh, so, yeah. so, cause you can't, that's easy to cheat. Cause you could, you know, oh, I rolled a natural. Well, and here we, we're talking game talk. Mm -hmm. And yeah. for those who, who don't know <laughs> what a natural, a nat 20 is, you know, a natural 20. Um, Find out you should, you should know that. <laughs> so we're not, now we're totally, you know, geeking out here. Um, cl class, did you mention class craft? I Are you mentioned Classcraft? I I don't have experience using it. But okay, because it it's a platform. Are you right. are aware? Yeah. yeah, that's actually developed platform for this very experience for the classroom. Right. Yes. Um, 
to be honest, I don't really have any reason why I haven't implemented it in my class other than the curriculum I have to teach is really compact. And so to take it apart mm -hmm. and put it into Classcraft mm -hmm. and then reintroduce Classcraft is a whole mechanism mm -hmm. that I, I, I'm admitting to myself now that I am part of that system of just checking all the boxes and hitting the yeah. criteria you know what i mean but i think this this time that i've had off from i've had a semester off and this time that i've had off is really making me take a second look at that and say hmm, well what is the purpose of hit, checking all those boxes if they haven't really hit those boxes you know if i'm just fudging numbers for the sake of getting through the day what's the purpose of the process, you know, the living experience. So what's before we end the call, uh, what's next? You know, what's the next step that you're going to take? I mean, the very next step that I'm going to take is get out of quarantine. <laughs> <laughs> and then I have Sounds good. I'm very excited to um, check out that game wander home. I have somebody who's going to do a um, a run through like a playthrough and a, i'm hoping to get in on that game so i can see what it looks like from the inside out cool i think that would be the a good next step i was about to say appropriate but i think a good next to kind of get in there and be either be the player be a player mm -hmm. and kind of analyze and synthesize what you're experiencing so you have a clue as to what you want your students to to experience mm -hmm. all right well, this was another good conversation, and I appreciate your time so much. Don't go.